Okay, hi everyone. Get settled in. Welcome everyone. This is uh, the ninth webinar in this ongoing discussion series on tipping elements and abrupt changes in the Earth system. I'll give a quick introduction of who I am in just one minute. But while we're waiting for the uh, clock to turn 15.30, I just uh, want everyone to settle down, grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, glass of water, or even a glass of wine if it's the evening where you are, and settle, settle in. You can still see participant numbers rising. So we'll just give folks 20 more seconds before we kick on and begin with this really exciting discussion and presentation. Okay, fantastic. I think we can start now. So welcome everyone. This is uh, the 10th webinar actually in this ongoing discussion series on tipping points, tipping elements, irreversibility and abrupt changes in the earth system. I'm Albert Nordstrom. I'm with Stockholm Resilience Center and the Global Resilience Partnership. And uh, as many of you might know, the goal of this discussion series is to advance knowledge on tipping elements, support efforts to increase consistency in treatment of tipping elements in the scientific community, help develop a research agenda, and design joint experiments and ideas for a tipping element model intercomparison, or TIPMIP for short. And there's three networks which are instrumental behind this discussion series. Um, we have the Earth Commission, which is a global team of scientists with a mission to define a safe and just corridor for people and the planet. We have AIMS, which stands for the Analysis, Integration and Modeling of the Earth System Project, which is a global research network composed of Earth system scientists and scholars seeking to develop different ways, interdisciplinary ways to understand the complexity of the natural world and its interactions with human activities. And now both AIMS and the Earth Commission are hosted by Future Earth, which is in itself a global network of scientists, researchers, and innovators collaborating for a more sustainable planet. And finally, the third network, which is instrumental for this discussion series is the Safe Landing Climates Lighthouse Activity of the World Climate Research Program, WCRP for short, which really acts to explore routes to safe landing spaces for human and natural systems. Okay, so today's discussion and presentations are really gonna focus on coral reefs. Uh, both of our speakers are gonna present before the Q&A session, um, but please, during their talks, feel free to post questions in the chat or in preferably in the Q&A function of, of the Zoom tool, and then indicate also to whom you want your question to be directed to. Um, there's also the, uh, the option to vote for your preferred questions, okay? So we'll get to those questions in a discussion session following immediately the presentations. We might also be putting out a link for an interactive Myra board. If there's interest, you can indicate for that in the chat as well. And in the Myra board, don't ask your questions, but leave comments or suggestions for future research. Um, and then you can look at that in a dynamic fashion, okay? And that Myra board, will be kept open throughout the week. And following the event today, we're gonna to post the recording on the Tipping Point Series Confetti webpage so it's accessible in the future, okay? So let's begin with our first speaker and it's my immense pleasure to introduce David Obura, who is a founding director of Cordio East Africa. And Cordio East Africa is a knowledge organization supporting sustainability of coral reef and marine systems in the Western Indian Ocean. And Cordio takes research to management and policy. It builds capacity, works with stakeholders, managers, and policymakers. And David's own primary research is on coral reef resilience, in particular to climate change and the biogeography of the Indian Ocean. So David's work is at the boundary, really, between science and action, and he works to integrate conservation and development through 
inclusive blue economy principles and links provided by global sustainability goals and targets. And his work really spans from the local scale through fostering innovative action to promote sustainability through regional scale alignment and integration all the way to the global scales, bringing knowledge and local regional practice into decision-making contexts. And now David also serves on the Earth Commission, which, as we mentioned before, is a scientific endeavor contributing to defining safe and just Earth system boundaries to underpin science-based targets for businesses, cities, and governments. So David, thanks for being here, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Albert. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to see some familiar names in the audience and to do this with Albert and Joni, who I know from, from times past. Um, and my charge in this first presentation is to try and address this question. How close are we to coral reefs tipping? Um, and I'll do that um, looking at some ecological considerations first, what does that mean uh, in terms of the, the state of a coral reef, and then going to some global considerations as well, and hopefully this will set up uh, fairly well for, for Joni's follow-on presentation coming, coming after this. And uh, while my home is in the Western Indian Ocean, the little map uh, down below, um, this is really of global relevance. Um, Coral reefs are invaluable around the world for their biodiversity, for their services, uh, ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people they provide. Um, I'm assuming uh, many people are quite familiar with that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, sort of justifying how important they are. There are many different uh, figures that have been published in terms of economic financial importance, as well as um, just the real uh, physical uh, importance to, to people and cultural importance around the world. Uh, now, because of this importance to people, not in spite of it, people often say in spite of their value, they are very threatened. It's because of their value that they're threatened through all these different uses that are amplifying over time. Um, and I don't have a slide on it, but I often use a slide of the Great Acceleration, uh, which uh, shows very well how so many different human pressures are accelerating all at the same time. So you have exponential increase in pressures. Coral reefs are really at the forefront of receiving those pressures in, in tropical waters around the world. So what does this mean on the big picture? Um, so we are, uh, the coral reefs are declining. We're losing coral cover, we're losing reef species, uh, populations are declining, functionality is declining. And this is, uh, this graph on the left um, is one from a uh, uh, paper by um, Eddie et al. and really shows against this baseline a long time back in the early 60s, much higher coral cover, that since the 1970s really, uh, our measurements of coral cover have been much lower um, and, uh, and declining uh, as we progress into the future. This is important not just because of loss of biodiversity, but in the map on the right is a map of the change in catch per unit effort of fisheries uh, around the world. And that bright red in the most populous countries uh, in the world, so around China, India, South Asia, Gulf of Aden, Indonesia, and the islands in that region are alarming for, for people dependent on reefs. The graph at the bottom from Sinner et al shows that coral reef sites are losing their capacity for meeting people's needs. So whether, and the black dots show uh, reefs that can only meet one of these three or, or multiple benefits to people from fish biomass for fisheries. Parrotfish scraping is an indicator of herbivory and resilience and trait diversity of fish, the, the variety of values that they can support. The black colors show the, the, the number of reef sites that are declining in their ability to support people's needs. So it's very important um, around the world. One of the responses to this is, to, is for the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network under the International Coral Reef Initiative. They've established since 1997, really. So fortunately, just before um, the, the first global mass bleaching event, corals, uh, this global network um, that has uh, compiled observations and coordinated um, at uh, sites around the world in the latest report we were able to put out in 2020 or 2021. And the results are, are interesting. Um, so this is the hard coral cover graph that is a synthesis of all those results from around the world showing how 
coral cover was basically stable before 1997 and that mean line uh, was basically horizontal i put a note at the against the uh the origin there showing that the higher baselines of coral cover for example in the graph that i showed a couple of slides before from eddie et al showed 50 to 90 percent coral cover but that was from a small number of, of sites and that was in the 1950s to 1970s or even pre-1970 so even using uh, the results from that paper already by the 70s and 80s you see uh, um, that there was a, a decline in reef health and then from 19 so but uncertainty was high because we don't have many data points before that 1998 we see the first sort of globally significant decline in coral cover so loss of coral reef health um, the number of surveys increased dramatically around this time so the confidence levels are much higher um, and this we estimated in this report killed about 8% of the world's corals. There was some recovery uh, from around 2002 to 2009 to pre-98 levels. And then again from 2009, a loss of 14% of the world's corals. And I'm showing this graph because this sort of addresses the question, what, what does a tipping point mean for coral reefs? Uh, and I'll come back to, to that question uh, with multiple slides. If you overlay a very simple analysis of, of high temperatures, because uh, we do know at this point that you know a lot of this mass um, regionally and globally significant losses in coral cover are related to thermal stress, see that the um, very strong association between rapid increases in global SST anomaly, that's the dark red lines, those were the first, second, and third uh, global mass coral bleaching events. Um, but then also you have this prolonged increase in temperature. So that black line, sorry, is the uh, is the anomaly or the the increase in the in the uh, in sea surface temperature during those seasons, um, and that has been going up uh, in some large steps, but also in some prolonged uh, increases. And those are associated with recently with this prolonged uh, decline of of coral cover and this is a direct impact of climate change we have this blue arrow for 2019 showing a small blip is that showing some initial recovery but how long will that go on for is the question there is of course regional variation in the status of reefs and the response of, of coral reefs to global signals of warming and there are many different reasons for this um, it's it shows the importance of regional differentiation in in tipping points uh, in understanding what's happening but the main thing to point out here is that while most regions followed similar trends, the East Asian seas actually followed, uh, showed an increasing trend from the sites that were monitored. So the green area in the in the map in the middle, uh, with that um, graph on the top, and on the side we show that I see even more than an incline an increase in coral cover was a decrease in algae cover, and so the ratio between corals and algae actually increased over that time. And so this is a question that the scientists in that region are looking at in more detail. And this map at the bottom from Eddie et al. shows a distribution of coral cover change around the world. And you can see that some the blue tinge in the northern parts of the East Asian region around Japan and some of the northern Philippine islands. So showing some increases in coral cover uh, where other parts within the subregion, within the region, are, are showing some declines. So there's a lot of variation from place to place, and that's important in considering what happens with a, a global signal. I work in the West Indian Ocean, and we have, um, our region has been quite active since 1998 uh, in terms of monitoring uh, what's happening with our reefs. And it looks like this is still preliminary data for after the bleaching event in 2016, because we did a regional report just afterwards, we have initial values of decline. So from the 2016 bleaching events and coral cover, we found that from before 1998 to after 1998, on average, the regional reefs stayed about the same. So some reefs that were not impacted um, declined for other reasons. Others were impacted by the bleaching uh, recovered and uh, to some extent, and so the mean was the same. Um, and there was an increase in algae cover, uh, sort of compensatory to that. And we're wondering if post-2016, we're seeing another step decline. And so this is sort of a ratcheting down in the health of, of the corals in the region. And again, what does that mean in terms of, of forthcoming tipping points? In terms of fish, we've seen over this time from early 2000s, this graph shows um, 
the biomass of herbivores and detritivores in green, uh, that line is actually going up to 2016, and of other functional groups of fish is going down. And so we're seeing a, a transition in our in our reefs from uh, so to higher abundance of algae and higher abundance of algae eating uh, fish. And does this mean a shift to an algal herbivory system from a more classic coral reef system? Um, we tried to look at this um, in a more decision support uh, framework, uh, looking at using the IUCN red list of ecosystems uh, to analyze the same regional data set. Um, and for those that don't know the red list of ecosystems, it's very much like the red list of species. You can assign the risk of collapse now because ecosystems don't go extinct, but they can collapse and become non-functional. So all the way from least concern in the right over there, that's the, 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 the most standard category through near threatens to the vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered threat uh, categories. Now, um, we found that overall, so all the coral reefs in the West Indian Ocean, this is about five or 6% of the world's coral reefs are vulnerable to collapse. And this is over a 50 year period. I'll go into some of the details in a moment. At an eco-regional level, so looking at a, at a finer scale of resolution in the eco-regions shown in the map, four eco-regions were vulnerable in yellow. And that's because of the signal from fishing, overfishing and its impact on, on top predators, which we use groupers uh, as a, as a um, proxy for that. Three ecoregions were endangered and four ecoregions were critically endangered. And all of these last seven were to warming. So the sea surface temperature signal more in the islands uh, is stronger than the signal from overfishing. So, so this begs the question, um, what does this mean in terms of, of tipping points? And this collapse model is actually quite similar to, to what we can think about for, for tipping points. The Red List of Ecosystems uses these five criteria for assessment, uh, two based on area, two based on biologic, abiotic and biotic integrity, and then a quantitative model. And the question then is, where does a tipping point occur? If we try and relate this to the burning embers type um, illustrations from the IPCC, what constitutes a tipping point in this case? Um, at a certain level, once they become vulnerable, is that going past the tipping point or going to endangered or critically endangered or just once they hit the point of collapse? At what scale? We have different results for ecoregions in the whole region. Um, does a tipping point get crossed when decline becomes inevitable? Perhaps the biotic signal or the reef system is not showing uh, yet to what degree it may collapse, but the drivers of decline are on such a increase and, and not being stopped that they that the tipping point will be crossed in the future inevitably uh, at some point because of the delay in responses between a sort of drivers and the state and impacts that they um, that they act on. So so these sorts of questions still need to be thought through to really uh, answer this question of uh, where are we in terms of tipping point for coral reefs. Um, just to give you an idea of how this, uh, the red list of ecosystems or the, the underlying data could be used. Our coral reefs, of course, are physical entities. So we saw the coral cover declining uh, past 10%. We used that as an indicator of decline and how what proportion of the sites decline below that level gives a, you know, tells you whether you would classify it as vulnerable, endangered, or critical. Criterion C um, is about environmental degradation, and we used um, thermal stress. So uh, degree heating works in, in degree heating weeks into the future using the projections that have been prepared by Ruben van Hoydink uh, and partners. And you can look at the relative severity of decline from the baseline levels, uh, so before thermal stress was high, to a critical threshold, and what proportion of your ecosystem is impacted by those levels to determine um, its uh, risk of collapse. And then criterion D is about biotic collapse. And so for this, we were able to use so four variables uh, in a fairly simple ecosystem model of corals, uh, algae cover, parrotfish, or herbivores, and groupers, or top predators. Uh, we established these thresholds. Uh, for, um, so here we are uh, back. I'll just put um, these. It was a slide, um, Albert, that I, that I got lost on. Um, yeah, but I think one. what I'll do, 
is just looking at the middle column, you can see that there are, depending on which variable you're looking at, there are multiple criteria or multiple thresholds of collapse. And this is useful in understanding the functioning of the system and understanding um, where a reef is at or how close it might be to an, an overall tipping point um, in, in terms of moving forward. So in terms of using this, um, we are very interested in, in having this um, be relevant in, in decision-making in policy uh, circles. And of course, right now in the Convention on Biological Diversity, we're all negotiating and discussing the global biodiversity framework, which will gives us targets for the next 10 years and goals for 30 years into the future for biodiversity. So it's, it's important to, to get those targets and goals right. And it's fortunate that among the new uh, headline indicators, so these are the most important indicators of the state of the system, particularly of ecosystem area and integrity for the goal A of the framework. Um, we have had in the past with the HE targets, the area of natural ecosystems was already uh, an indicator that was used, but of course that doesn't tell you much about that state of the state of that ecosystem. But we feel the red list of ecosystems can give you a lot of information about the integrity um, or the health of a system. And so um, this has been proposed as one of the uh, emerging headline indicators. It's been given a readiness level of two, so it still needs to work. But the components of the red list of ecosystems can support uh, looking at ecosystem condition at global levels, so at large scales. So it enables ecosystem specific variables to be used to generate a single common indicator. So that's important because ecosystems are all very different. But also then variables for multiple biotic elements can be used as indicators of multiple or potential tipping points which is very informative for management and policy responses. So then thinking forward, so what future for coral reefs if threats just keep increasing? Um, and so this graph, I think will be familiar to anybody who has gone through the, the, the latest the IPCC uh, assessment report number six. Um, on the left is the, uh, the, the graph of the expected surface temperature change with different um, SSP um, scenarios, uh, showing the best policy response down below and the limited policy response up above. You can see where we are, and you can see that on the right with these burning embers for the re reasons for concern, coral reefs are front and center in that RFC1, the unique and threatened ecosystems, and we're already well into the red uh, in terms of the threat uh, from just from warming alone. Um, and those two lines above show the current commitments and the current practices, perhaps as a question mark, meaning, of course, we need to we need it to do a lot to get close to the commitments that we made, just the pledges. But even more than that, we need the pledges to to be increased to get down to below two degrees uh, as well. And warming to date for coral reefs, this is a paper a few years ago by Hughes et al, showing very dramatically how coral reef locations around the world have moved from um, uh, this very you know, strong upward curve in temperatures being experienced um, at coral reef locations, and that this is really uh, impacting reefs globally. So there's a couple of approaches uh, to think uh, through this, uh, what can be done, and I'm, I'm just keeping to the sort of ecological perspective in the background. Um, so here, the 50 reefs approach, which uh, perhaps many are familiar of from 2018, the references are down below was look, try to look at which reefs are the safest versus those that cross their tipping points first, or which, which reefs have the best climate futures. And those are the blues uh, in the map above. So to what degree is a reef least vulnerable to climate change, but also well-placed to replenish other reefs in 2050, particularly thinking about replenishments if we do get climate stabilization um, as early as possible. Um, I won't go into the detail of the inputs, but identified a range of reefs around the world, and this inset of Zanzibar shows, you know, just how it looked for that system. Um, where are the best climate futures, and at what point does the hole stop being a hole? So that's why I put this up uh, for this discussion on global tipping points. You know, if we do remain with those blue dots as, as you know, healthy coral reefs very much intact uh, and like their prior state, is that still a globally connected system or does it break down into, into something other than that? Um, this graph uh, looks at a single, uh, sorry, I jumped two cents. Um, 
this great paper came out uh, just recently by David Armstrong McKay and colleagues looking at global tipping elements. Um, and, you know, coral reefs have qualified as one of those. I'm not sure we should be proud of that um, amongst the various other uh, global tipping elements. Many of those are uh, cryosphere elements up in the, in the polar regions. Um, but low latitude coral reefs are perhaps one of the most prominent. And the reason is uh, in the table down below because of the, the green coloring and the green is not a sign of, of anything being good. The green is a sign of the certainty of the results that they are very close to this sort of, or we're already within the minimum to maximum range of the tipping element uh, for, for warming in degrees Celsius. We're currently at about 1.2, getting very close to that median estimate of 1.5. Um, and of course, I think the global community is, is very well aware of this. Another question about this global tipping elements, tipping points, looking at single or multiple drivers of decline. What is, where is, this is the SETA paper that also just came out in the last few weeks. Uh, when do we cross the threshold uh, of the tipping point for coral reef decline? Is it past 50% impact? So I've put a few um, arrows on graphs over there. Or is it just a one or multiple stresses um, in, in each of those graphs? Or is it where we go past an inflection point of apparent no return, in which case it would go quite a bit or quite a bit sooner? And look, many of those arrows are pointing towards 2025 and before 2030 as, as passing tipping point for coral reefs. This map from that paper, I think, is very instructive looking at the suitability, suitable sites. Uh, when did these sites cross their suitability threshold? The red is 1950, yellow is 2000, green is 2050 and blue is 2100. As you look at these SSP scenarios from good in the bottom to bad at the top, um, already there's a lot of red through all of those. So many reefs are already, according to this analysis, past uh, you know, a threshold um, before, before the 2000s. Uh, and so I think that is really quite worrying. And then looking at the refuges for coral reefs in 2100 under the worst case climate scenario, there's a couple of stars in that upper map um, in 2100. None of them are, 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 are mainstream coral reef sites right now, and they're quite small marginal reef areas, which is a sign of hope for, for some of those reefs. The Global Horizon Scan of Issues Impact from Marine Coastal Diversity, um, Biodiversity was published um, now a few months ago. And this was alarming to me. I was part of this paper, and I really pushed for this message to come through, that if you look at climate velocity trajectories, so movement of species and ecosystems with warming, basically moving forward, and we hear a lot about what that means in temperate zones, about transitions and tropicalization. But the equator of this means that everything is moving out and nothing is moving in. Uh, if you look at the second graph there, this looks at uh, key biodiversity areas on continents, islands, and in the ocean. And green are those key biodiversity areas whose climate envelope stays stable enough for that key biodiversity area to remain. And there's less than 3%, even at one degree warming there. And this is about 2000 levels. So this is not pre-industrial. So, you know, particularly for corries and coastal areas, almost nowhere will have a similar climate in the future to what it has had in, in the past, uh, of a meaning, that is meaningful to the species and ecosystems found there. So the question is, David, my last slide is, have we crossed? Okay, yeah, good. I'll just Albert. a friendly reminder that we have a few minutes left. <laughs> but I saw you there, but you were very quiet, Sorry. Albert. You didn't tell me to stop. <laughs> so my last our slide is this, have we already crossed the threshold of tipping points for coral reefs? And I think, to my mind, looking at the actions that we need to take to maintain reefs in, a, you know, in, in what we have described as coral reefs and considering the drivers of climate change and the economic and societal drivers, we're nowhere close to staying or remaining within the safe limits for coral reefs. We're already so committed to change, we've pushed them so far past that limit that they will change uh, irredeemably. Of course, there are many things we can do, and I think Joni will talk about this a lot in terms of future actions, uh, but I think in terms of historic coral reefs, um, they, they won't be there. They'll be very different uh, in the future. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David, and thanks for, for reconnecting back. Of these connectivity issues that do not make the life of a presenter easier on this, in this virtual space that we're operating in. Mm -hmm. Um, and just a quick um, reminder for anyone to, that has questions, please pose them in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, you have a great opportunity now to pick the, the minds of two of the most 
um, foremost um, researchers in coral reef science. So take that chance. Um, and now moving on, it's my great pleasure to also introduce a second panelist, the second speaker, um, Joni Claypas, who's a marine ecologist and geologist that focuses on how coral reefs and other marine ecosystems are affected by changes in the Earth's atmosphere and climate. Um, global warming, for example, is causing tropical ocean temperatures to increase faster than corals can adapt, resulting in high rates of coral bleaching. And this is one of the major causes of the present rapid degradation of coral reef ecosystems. Ocean acidification is another major threat to coral reefs because as the oceans absorb much of the CO2 released to the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation, seawater pH, pH declines and reduces the ability of corals and many other organisms to build their skeletons and shells. So Joni's research strives to guide efforts to conserve coral reefs and other marine ecosystems during this high CO2 window that is inevitable over the next few decades. And she works closely with ocean modelers to help identify where reefs might persist into the future and has been working with the reef restoration project Raising Coral Costa Rica for the past five years. Joni, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Albert. That was a very nice introduction. I'm looking for my right, my correct, um, there it is. Let me see if I can share that. Is it visible? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks to um, both you and David for providing such a nice introduction to this very um, depressing uh, and tough topic. Um, I think we, we can all agree that this is a, a coral reefs in a very dire state and it's difficult to stay optimistic, but we do need to try and remain as optimistic as we can because uh, that is what drives innovation and solutions to climate change. So I'm gonna provide a, um, a brief summary of what scientists and practitioners and citizens and governments are doing to try to either avoid or delay the tipping point for coral reefs. And I really wanna thank the organizers of these, this series uh, I encourage everyone to go back and look at some of the previous uh, series. They super interesting topics, and I'm sure they provide, they also provide a lot of background to what we are talking about today. Okay, so I uh, my outline is kind of a, a corny list of topics to cover, but uh, perhaps you will remember these um, for the... Um, <clears throat> I'm in trouble with my, my marker. I have three particular things that I want to talk about that will allow us to, that we have to keep in mind for avoiding the tipping point. One is that we have to move very fast. As, as David showed in his uh, talk, we are, you know, a lot of reefs are probably already past the tipping point. Uh, in 20 to 30 years, I mean, most reefs are considered to be in grave danger of, of collapse. Um, we also need to, to think about the kind of things we can do over larger areas. So we need to be vast in our thinking. How do we strategically scale to coral populations and ecosystem um, extent? And then we also need to find solutions that last. So how do we maximize probability to um, reach success? And that's by targeting the right places and having the right organization. And David also mentioned some of that um, in terms of like the 50 Reefs Initiative. So I'm going to start with a study that was uh, published in 2021 with uh, 26 coral reef scientists that uh, were brought together to um, think about this topic of avoiding reef collapse. Of course, you know, you put this many reef scientists in a room, you're not gonna agree on very many of the details, but that was a good thing because it illustrated where we need to find more work. So I'm gonna present a few results from this paper. Just to recap um, some of what uh, David was talking about uh, earlier. Um, if we look at the modeled um, Different, the, the differences in the model projections. On the left-hand side, this is um, based on the NCAR community earth system model. And we can see that there are 
um, you know, these are the two extremes of where we can go in the future. And the, this is the average temperature across reefs worldwide uh, based on the year starting in 1955. And you can see that the, the gray line is the RCP 8.5 scenario. This is the worst case scenario, hopefully, uh, that we could reach. And the uh, as opposed to that is this RCP 2.6 scenario, which shows a, a very similar rise up through about 2040, but thereafter the temperatures begin to stabilize. And that's a key point because if, as we look at the, excuse me, this is jumping around. Um, if we look at the, the um, projections uh, in terms of which percentage of reef cells that will bleach, in this case, severely two or more times per decade, we call that unsustainable rates of bleaching, uh, we can calculate uh, how the um, how many of these reef cells will bleach every year. And if you look at the solid lines, those are lines that indicate uh, no adaptation in these ecosystems. In other words, it's based on temperature adaptation of these earlier years. We see that it doesn't really matter if we take the low scenario or the high emission scenario, there is um, going to be a lot of bleaching by the year of 2040, and that would be an indicator of where most reefs would collapse. If you allow for adaptation, however, a lot of studies don't do this because we don't really know what those numbers would be, but we put in a, a modest adaptation rate for these two scenarios. You can see that under the high emission scenario, you, you delay that collapse by a few years, but uh, under the low emission scenario, it paints a much better picture. Basically, you uh, the adaptation allows the corals to, to keep up with climate change through that 2040, 2050 period. And after that, when climate stabilizes, then the reefs will cease to, to um, have all of the severe bleaching events and can even come back. So the main point of this figure, sorry, the main point of this figure is that both the high and low projections result in unsustainable bleaching by mid-century if we have no adaptation. But if we do include adaptation, then the low projection actually buys us some time to do something and gives us an opportunity to help coral reefs survive. I wanna say this adaptation rate, some corals adapt faster than others. So this doesn't apply to every coral species, but it's just a, a sort of a, uh, an exercise to examine, you know, how do, we, how do we include adaptation in these projections? So we also looked at what are, uh, how to address these, um, you know, what actions can be taken and they fall under three major categories. One is addressing the causes of climate change, um, that would be, you know, the best thing that you can do because it affects reefs. It, it not only um, would improve the state of coral reefs, but it's globally, uh, it would improve the state of all ecosystems. So it's absolutely the best thing that we can do. Uh, if we don't do that, then there's a lot of considerations for managing solar radiation, manipulating environmental conditions as shown in the yellow here. Um, these are some often considered somewhat drastic measures that may be taken if, if necessary. And then uh, the thing that we address the most or examine the most is how do you support the biological, ecological, and societal adaptation to make this work? So a lot of these things are things we're doing already. That is to increase coral reef resilience. Um, and a lot of the other things, particularly at the bottom of this green box, are things that are people are actively engaging in to try to accelerate uh, the ability of corals to adapt to this changing environment. So when we asked everyone to evaluate each one of these things based on several categories, how effective it would be, how ready are they for being um, implemented? What are the co-benefits of doing this action? Uh, are there disbenefits to doing this action? And then how acceptable are some of these things to society? We also asked them to uh, you know, create a scale of, of um, over what spatial scales these things operate. And the results are pretty interesting. Of course, addressing climate change had the highest scores. It occurs again over global scales and uh, it has the, certainly has the highest level of co-benefits. 
um, geoengineering had the lowest scores. A lot of that is because of all the risks that are associated or perceived with um, those type of actions. And then in the middle are all of these things to support adaptation. We scored moderately. Higher scores were, were um, resulted for those actions that are already in place and lower scores were provide, um, given for those interventions that were in process and that hadn't quite been tested yet. So what are some of these interventions that people are doing? Well, a lot of these are familiar to people. Reef restoration is kind of a backbone for a lot of um, um, efforts and for learning how to restore uh, uh, reefs to some future state. And then there are things like managed reproduction, which is getting a lot of uh, research attention, assisted adaptation, evolution, assisted migration. Uh, cryopreservation is also advancing, but that's not just for long-term banking of corals for the future. It's also a way to safely move coral gametes around. In other words, for assisted migration, than it, than, than it is to move corals themselves, where you don't want you know, to introduce things like diseases or invasive species. So there's a lot of innovations that are coming out of this that are pretty exciting and have a lot of application beyond their original intent. Interventions um, have really, really grown in the last 10, 15 years. This slide is provided by Andrew Baker from Rasmus. And he's divided up all of the different ways. So many different things, I can't possibly cover all of these in a single talk but uh, they fall generally under genetic and re reproductive interventions, physiological interventions, many of these we're familiar with already, um, population and community interventions. And then there's new, new things coming in all the time. For example, there are developments of materials that can be placed on reefs that will maybe enhance um, the settlement of larvae onto the reef and maybe uh, uh, enhance the recruitment potential as well. So the next thing is how do we how do we apply some of these things across a vaster network than simple restoration sites or conservation areas or even MPAs? And I like this paper by Dan Holstein and others because it really talks about how we have to think in terms of coral populations. In this paper, they addressed Orbicella annularis, uh, and they. Um, it's, it's a fairly technical paper, but just to describe it briefly here, they looked at two things. They looked at metapopulation persistence, and that would be shown here in this large purple area as the metapopulation, which is connected by these uh, con lines of connectivity indicating uh, exchange of larvae between the reefs. And uh, the second thing would be this thermal vulnerability of the reef node. So in this case, in um, the present day, present decade, you can see that the, uh, these nodes are have a, a fairly low vulnerability in these uh, particular time period. We jump 30 years ahead, um, you can see that this has changed quite a bit. Uh, the metapopulation persistence has gone down, there's fewer lines of connectivity and the therm thermal variability of the nodes has gone um, to a much higher level. And it's even worse um, in the previous slide, you can see that there's still um, persistence of the metapopulation, but it becomes fragmented in the, the following decade, as you can see here. So I think uh, one of the main points here is that there, that the authors made is that there are locations that are key to maintaining the persistence of the population. They make this point and call them uh, thermal refugia. And to quote them, they say that these thermal refugies were the, were, are the linchpins of metapopulation persistence during moderate thermal stress. And uh, that targeted uh, conservation or restoration that supports connectivity between these refugees by enhancing local population growth or, or sexual propagation may be critically important to species conservation on coral reefs. I think this is, in my mind, one of the best examples of how we need to rethink where we uh, target our activities to, to get the most bang for our buck. This is just one example of, uh, you know, several groups are looking at this now. Um, 
there are things that are going on under the water that are not actually detected by satellite at the surface. In this case, we're, we're um, a nice paper by Wall and others looked in the Andaman Sea at, at the impacts of internal gravity waves on coral reefs. And the internal gravity waves are similar to surface waves on the ocean, except that they propagate at depth along sharp diver, uh, density grad gradients, such as long, along a thermocline. They're caused by tidal forces that interact with bathymetry and they can propagate long distances. And when they occur near reefs and break, they can uh, have a strong cooling effect and cause rapid temperature fluctuations at the same frequency as the tides. Um, and these have been shown to be beneficial to reefs as uh, Wall showed in their study uh, that the uh, exposed, the, the side of the reef that was exposed to internal gravity waves had much higher temperature variability and did not bleach nearly as much as shown in, in uh, these two photographs here as those that occurred on the, the leeward side of the reef. So this was a demonstration to them that these um, presence of internal gravity waves were actually quite protective uh, or had a protective effect on some of these reefs. So where do these occur? Uh, my colleague, Scott Bachman, has uh, published a really nice paper um, on where these things occur uh, globally. And on the left-hand side is, is just a, a, a figure of where they occur in the coral triangle. There happen to be a lot of these internal gravity waves there. This is the mean daily temperature range at a depth of 50 meters, but um, we also have the information at, at multiple depths. And this is based on a very high resolution uh, MIT GCM simulation that um, was carried out for 14 months. And it showed some really interesting data. The Coral Triangle has a lot of these, it's probably due to the bathymetric complexity and to the depth of the where these density gradients are. And you, not so much do we see those in the Caribbean side or in the Atlantic. However, if we have a look on the right-hand side here at, at various locations um, that are pinpointed here, What's interesting is uh, looking at the mean daily temperature range, these tend to have a, a large impact at deeper depths. Here, this is 50 meters. And in some places, these do um, have impact on reefs that are 45 meters deep or 10 meters deep, but they rarely have much impact at the very surface of the reef. So we may be missing a lot of thermal refugia by not uh, identifying where these things occur. You can actually look at a, a global map of these refugia at this location here and uh, look at the various steps and see if you, if, you know, if this study actually highlights any regions of interest to you. So in order to have these sort of lasting effects for reefs, you really need to, to identify where we should be doing reef conservation and restoration. So a lot of good effort here, but we could get a lot more out of it and a lot of long-term success if we do a better job of identifying these type of thermal refugia and nodes that are important for larval connectivity and metapopulation persistence. Another thing we need to do, we have a lot of innovations, but it's pretty hard to push them into the field where a lot of reef restoration work is going on and conservation work is going on. So we have a lot of high powered research and innovation, and then we have the local practitioners. And this is a, a common problem with everything from cancer research to farming, where you know, these innovations need to be pushed out into practice faster. So we call this lab side to reef side transfer. And so the idea is, is are we doing enough? We know we have things like the Agricultural Extension Service here, which is very useful like for farmers to both test new innovations, to report back about new innovations and to improve their crops. Some of the earliest sort of extension services uh, were to teach farmers, for example, how to rotate their crops. Um, there are many models for doing this properly. I think we are close to, to having all of the things that we need to try to make this successful. When you look across the global distribution of reefs, um, 
we have two, you know, several examples of where groups are really organizing to try to do this better. One is the Coral Restoration Consortium, which focuses on the Caribbean region, but includes other regions as well. And then the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, which is the focus in, in Australia. And so if you just look at the map here, where else can we have these kind of uh, strong um, research type of activities that connect well with people on the ground who are trying to, to get that practice going. I'm not saying that these are doing this perfectly right now. I think with, with more organization, we can do them better though. And let's remind ourselves that most coral reefs occur in underdeveloped countries that don't have access to these laboratories or genetic testing or that sort of thing. And so I would really like to um, suggest that as a topic of future conversation. I also want to bring up some surprises that not only give us a little hope, um, hopefully not false hope, um, but also give us direction where we can be doing more innovation. This is the example from the Australian Institute of Marine Science long-term monitoring program, which showed that following the 2016, 2017 major coral bleaching in that area where things were looking very bad, that there was actually very high recovery. This high recovery was with a really fast growing coral that many feel maybe will be vulnerable to future um, warming events. But still, it gives us this uh, sense that the coral reef still can remain resilient if you have enough corals intact to uh, spawn and put their larvae in, back into the system. Um, and a very similar sort of article came out in National Geographic by Enrique Sala. For, um, which look at following the mortality, the high mortality of Pasolifora during that same warming event, uh, there was really rapid recovery um, of, of one of the Montipora species. And their key points in looking at this recovery of the reef is that it was due to healthy fish populations. And that's no surprise because those fish populations keep the fleshy algae down and the Second point is that there was an abundance of coral and algae. So we focus a lot on the corals. Um, we also do a lot of focus on, on reef fish as well, but maybe we should be uh, thinking about restoring coral and algae on reefs faster and encouraging more larval settlement and recovery that way. So I'm just going to close here by uh, going back to the original slide. We need to move fast, uh, as David emphasized, and as almost any model will project. We don't have much time to work. We need to be vast and I think we can be smarter about how we deploy our innovations. And we need to make solutions that last. So we have to, to think about targeting the right places to our, our research. And we also need to think about how we can speed up the transfer of research to reef side efforts. So with that, I thank you all for um, uh, organizing this talk, particularly uh, Carolyn Zim. She's been magnificent to prepare us for these kind of things. And, uh, and also thank all of you for, for joining this series. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Joni, for the excellent talk and for being spot on time. I didn't even have to make any intervention. And I think your talk really nicely complemented um, David's presentation. So I've seen there's already a few questions um, that have been thrown out in the Q&A tool. Um, just keep them coming. Uh, we won't be able to go through all of them, but I'll do my best to pick a good selection. Um, but to uh, kick off the discussion, um, I just like with a broad question going to both panelists, and it has to do with the temporal aspects of reducing CO2 emissions. And um, Joni, I, I picked up when you mentioned that some of the innovations you spoke about won't be effective unless we keep CO2 emissions low what happens if we don't manage to reduce CO2 emissions in time, if we're not fast enough? And this also links the second part of a question came from the audience. Is the collapse of coral reefs gonna happen even with a temporary overshoot above 1.5 for a few years? So what, ha what happens then, even though we somehow managed to bring global warming to 1.5 later this century, is a temporary overshoot enough to cross some of these tipping points? Um, I can start with you, Joni, and then David, you can jump in afterwards. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like David to chime in on this one. It's a big uh, topic. Um, 
I think as, as David mentioned earlier, you know, we probably we are seeing that some reef ecosystems are collapsing. I, I mentioned the meta population sort of work because I think that um, even though we may lose parts of those reefs by targeting areas where we can keep reefs going, um, I think we can sustain even small subpopulations for a while. And I also, uh, I'm encouraged by some of the work with deeper areas that might be these refugia. So these refugia may persist. They may not be protecting all the coral reefs in the way that society needs them, but they may be protect, we may be able to protect them for long enough for when we do finally stabilize climate that they will come back. And that's sort of the short answer to a long discussion. Thanks, Joni. David, any reflections on those, that two-part question? Yeah, sure. So as Joni said, I mean, so we're already losing a lot of coral reefs. And, and so, I mean, the question I pose is when, when do we know if a, a tipping point has been crossed? And I think Joni's, what, what Joni says is really right, that there's not a single tipping point, there's a long gradient. And at every point in time, we have an opportunity to, to, to change the path and move into a better future. The thing is that, you know, we've already lost quite a bit of coral at 1.2 degrees warming. So overshooting past 1.5, uh, we will show, we will lose a certain amount. Uh, Joni showed a graph that showed if, if we, with coral adaptation by 2070 or so, conditions will, will be suitable again for, for corals that have adapted, uh, you know, to those levels. But at that point, we'll have lost a lot of genetic diversity in the more sensitive species. And so those remaining corals will, yes, be able to repopulate and there will be advances, as, as Joni has pointed out, that can, that can um, you know, accelerate the repopulation and recovery of reefs. But it will be of much less genetic diversity of different species. Um, and so there is, I think it's really important to, to be really clear that, that there is, yeah, that there is a certain amount of loss. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on and answer some of the other questions why. I push that message. It's a very dark and a hard message, but we have to understand, you know, how hard the work is ahead of us. Thanks, both of you. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back to some of those issues um, later on. Um, an another mm -hmm. series of questions deal with the, the involvement of traditional fisher communities, local ecol ecological knowledge um, into restoration or conservation processes. It'd be interesting to hear your reflections about how we can improve this side. I mean, do you have any really good bright spots or examples? Jody, Joni, you mentioned a few during your talk, but I'm guessing David also, you must have worked with a lot of local regional practitioners and local stakeholders in trying to implement a more kind of co-produced um, manner of conserving and restoring reefs. Um, so just, any examples which we could glean hope from, but also a few principal or key um, attributes that should underpin this type of work to make it successful. I could start with you, um, David. Okay, sure. So I think in that sense, the sort of the, the hope spots or the, the spots of hope in that sense are quite well recognized in the scientific literature now. And that's really understanding the, the stewardship and the rights and responsibilities of local communities and indigenous communities in the areas where they live and really giving agency and empowerment to make decisions. Um, now, to be honest, I mean, I, I work in Africa and I'm, I'm not in favor of, of going to a lot of communities and doing a lot of coral restoration work with them because, you know, they're, they're hunting, they're, sorry, they're fishing to, to get their kids to school and living at very low income levels. And so the benefits that the restoration will provide are not as much as good fisheries management, reducing pollution and bringing down, down CO2 and providing other opportunities. And I think that the real responsibility that we have in science and conservation is we do have great science that, that shows what the targets should be um, in terms of conservation, trying to improve the state of biodiversity. We need to bring that science down to local levels and really empower local authorities and local leaders to to identify how they can incorporate these and meet these and what assistance they need and then that that support needs to come from from wealthier communities from the international community to really help make that happen so local and shared spaces are critical we need to give agency there 
I, I will comment on that briefly because I am working on reef restoration in Costa Rica. And after five years, I would say that our best investment in that program has been in the local people. The amount of ownership and interest and um, capacity to learn more and, and their eagerness to learn more and to do the right things has been um, incredibly encouraging to me, which is why I, I sort of push for this sort of extension application is putting this really good information as we learn information is empowering them, as you said, David, to do, ex you know, to take those and, and then also to provide feedback to us. It's, it's the only way we're going to get enough projects going. The problem in my mind is how do we finance that? People eat crops and farmers make money after selling their crops, but we don't do a very good job of, of showing that sort of direct value of restoration and conservation in the hands of the people. So that it's gonna it's gonna require some creative financing to make that work. Payment for ecosystem services or some other mechanisms to to really, really empower people to do that kind of work, to take this lab and research type of work and, and implement it in their own projects. Thanks, Joni, and thanks, David. So, I mean, so what I'm taking a bit from that is what's really required is a more transdisciplinary approach to conservation and restoration work within coral reef science, and not just working across disciplines, but working across academic, non-academic boundaries and introducing and, and, you know, upscaling and magnifying the work of boundary organizations and um, those kind of entities. Just a quick, you know, just building off since we're talking about this topic, are you seeing those trends happening and are they happening fast enough, especially as both of you come initially from the coral ecology side? I mean, is that transdisciplinary shift happening fast enough? in this space. Off to you, Jenny, go ahead. <laughs> I, I would say no, <laughs> I don't, it needs to go faster. Uh, it, it definitely needs to go faster, but it, it, it is a, a, a new world, like I said, compared to farming or other ways that we really have had revolutions in how we provide food to people. We need a similar kind of revolution in how we conserve this ecosystem that does provide all of these services that David mentioned in this talk. So um, I, I keep looking for uh, like terrestrial sort of examples that we can follow and how to in, implement this quickly. Um, and it, it's going to take, you, you said the word is transdisciplinary and it, it has to cross a lot of political lines and, and willpower to do it. And at the same time, we're competing with a lot of other ecosystems and, um, and particularly social systems that are um, also in need of attention um, to deal with climate change. So uh, even though coral reefs are super important, we have to realize there are many other competitions for the kind of attention they need to be successful. Yeah, so, if I, yeah. Yeah, so if I build on that a little bit. So I certainly agree with Joni that no, that increased transdisciplinarity is not happening fast enough. Um, it's, it's, it's happening for sure, and, and especially in the last few years, and they're fantastic. Um, but I don't see the transdisciplinarity of the science as the primary you know, variable that's affecting how well we're doing with coral reefs. It's really understanding what the drivers of decline are, and we're not addressing those. I mean, we can do all sorts of great stuff looking at the reef and finding new solutions at the reef and with communities and with students. Um, but the drivers of decline are all happening behind, you know, from land or from economies, from international trade. And to be honest, we're, we're not doing near enough work to, to transform those systems. So we're, 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 we're putting, taking our foot off the pedal and stopping the acceleration of the various factors that are causing this reef decline. CO2 is one of them, but it's just one. There's a lot of other indicators of, of overconsumption, overproduction that are out there. And if we don't, if we don't change those things, all the work that we do in the water will, will be undermined. No, thanks. Um, while, while we're staying on this topic, I, I am aware that there's other questions dealing with a bit more detailed elements of your talks, and we'll go back to them. But let's, let's stick to this. Um, there's, there's one question here, and I can build up in, 
on it um, as well. But how much of this information and this knowledge and this science that you've been presenting now is, is being fed into the ICRI and the GCRF? And um, excuse my ignorance, these are acronyms. I know a lot of acronyms, but I don't know those two acronyms. And I'm hoping you, David, and Joni know those acronyms, the ICRI and the GCRF. But the question was, you know, how much of this knowledge is being fed into those organizations and have they picked up any of these ideas? Would that help? Or are there obstacles in that kind of transmission of knowledge to those two acronyms? And you can, you can spell them out so I get to learn what they are as well. <laughs> David lives in acronym world. I'll let him tackle that one first. <laughs> <laughs> I do live in acronym world. And so the CRE, the International Coral Reef Initiative is the first one. And that's, that's a, a global institution of countries and organizations that's been in existence since 1994. Um, and the International Coral Reef Society, so our main scientific body on coral reefs is part of that. And I would say, yes, the, the science is really penetrating into ICRI. It's very interested in these results. Both Joni and I uh, work quite a lot within the ICRI systems. The Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network I, I presented from is, is part of it. And then the GCRF is the Global Coral Reef Fund. And it's looking at how to support innovative science transdisciplinarity action on the ground and solutions so so yes they are very interested in wanting to soak up all of this information uh, but as journey presented we you know the challenge is is the finance they the gcrf is not big enough yet it needs to grow to you know 10 times larger than what it is to make a difference and there needs to be a lot of a lot of other sort of action as well so perhaps i'll have journey knows more about some of the, the technical uh, solutions in there perhaps I, I don't really have uh, so much to add on that, but I would say, yes, there's a lot of interest in uh, from these um, organizations like ICRI and um, the Global Reef Fund and these and CORDAP and others in, in not just, you know, funding innovation, but how do we fund it to get out there faster too? Uh, I think we're, we're you know, we're kind of uh, behind the ball on that one. We need to move faster. I think we are, we also just don't have enough people on the ground. And I mean, from my experience, there are a lot of people trying to do this work on the ground because they feel passionate, but we haven't locked in with them well to train them how to do it. And that's why I mentioned some of these larger organizations because they are trying to engage um, a lot of groups from a wide, you know, variety of um, income levels and so forth to try to to try to encourage them at least to learn and stay engaged. But the funding again is, is the thing that's lacking so far. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, thanks both of you. Well, the final question on this big scale, and then we'll, we'll go down to, to, to other levels. Um, one thing that's been, you know, and I, I have a background in coral reef ecology and I've moved on to other systems and other questions the past 10 years, but I've always been, Fascinating that we don't have some kind of international binding treaty that focuses on alleviating coral reef degradation. Um, yeah, coral reefs have been mentioned like the Convention of Biological Diversity, the AG targets, but it's not a binding treaty, despite, in my eyes, like there's several favorable factors that there should be something like that. I mean, this presence of supporting business interests, this public appeal, there's a relatively small number of nations involved, you know. Why do you think, I think you've answered some of this, but why do you think this is, this is so? And there was a question as well from the audience that kind of picks up on that. Can we then piggyback or strengthen on other existing laws and treaties like maritime laws and policies against deep sea fishing and deep sea mining? Could that be a, you know, a shortcut into some kind of international binding treaty that focuses on specifically coral reef degradation? Sorry for blowing it up to the massive scale, but I think we're going <laughs> to some really interesting things here. And I'd just like to have your reflections on that. I, I, I am not so much in that policy world uh, as David is, but um, I do see the point that um, both in terms of topic and in terms of like um, nation by nation, there's a different approach to how to do this. There's not a uh, collaborative approach to to managing these things, and every 
every country has its own rules, has its own policies, its own restrictions about tackling this problem. And when you, you know, show them that we can do this work in, in our, you know, your waters, but um, there's a lot of influence from the waters in the neighboring countries as well, it gets a little discouraging. So some sort of global treaty to, uh, with this regard would be um, welcome. Uh, is that the fastest place we can work and have the most impact? I, I personally don't know that uh, because I think it's slow to move those kind of things. But uh, often the policymakers will follow successes on the ground um, particularly in terms of like, you know, restore, you know, protecting a reef and then seeing that the fishermen are actually happy because they are producing more, you know, they're catching more fish because of it. Those kind of successes need to be put out there as an incentive for those things. But uh, I think David can talk to the policy world much better than I can. <laughs> so I, so to some extent like you, Albert, I, to be honest at the moment, I am moving more for reef science just to work more much more in sustainability science, partly because of what you've just raised. Is, you know, personally, I think there's no value in trying to go from the nationally binding treaty focused on coral reefs. I mean, why not one on forests or grasslands or wetlands or other things? Um, and there are some of those. We have Convention on Biological Diversity and its, its strategies and, and targets, but we didn't come anywhere close to meeting the last 10 year strategy. So uh, it's not, but even if it were binding, I doubt it, it would really work. Um, I think the closest thing we have to, as a signpost to where things need to go is the sustainable development goals, but the level of commitment to those is, is very wanting in various places, particularly from the perspective, we're, we're just all married to this idea of growth. Every country wants to grow, every system wants to grow. And as long as we focus just on growth, the no ecosystem will do well. Uh, we have to change that and so really getting commitment behind the SDGs and understanding what it means in terms of economic practices and you know capitalist desires and things like that those are where the solutions will come from meanwhile we have to try and manage our ecosystems and do the best we can to restore what we can and keep them functioning but I think that's 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 your globally binding treaty as a sustainable development goals that's the closest we've got thanks David Thanks, Johnny, as well. Um, now a slightly more technical question now, but it's nonetheless, it's, it's important and interesting. Um, David, you showed some, some graphs over regional and global trends of coral cover and you know, big indicators of, of health of coral reefs. And there was some, at least in some of the regional plots, some temporary recovery trends that were observed. Mm -hmm. um, what was driving these recovery trends in your mind? And maybe Joni as well, you can reflect, and you as well, David, were these to the type of interventions mentioned in Joni's presentations or were there other reasons behind them? Yeah, so so unfortunately on that, I'll have to answer clearly, I'm absolutely not. <laughs> there is no way any interventions we do right now have any scale of impact beyond the level of hectares of reef, for example, in, in a local area, which is why we need a lot of research and development to increase that impact and really understand how we can scale up from that. I mean, all of that recovery that has happened has come from natural processes, from natural succession and systems of recovery and those systems not being so degraded by pollution or overfishing that they actually can recover from the bleaching. Sadly, the, what I also showed was the ratcheting down of coral cover and the ratcheting up of algae cover in the West Indian Ocean. We are undermining the ability of the system to, to replenish itself and to recover. Um, and with these warming events becoming you know, more severe and more frequent uh, and other pressures going up, we're really sort of we're really narrowing that window that reefs have to to be able to do that uh, hence the need for more active measures as well but they're still at a small scale johnny i'm just going to invite you in if you have any reflections on that um on this specific I issue totally agree with david those were natural processes this is how ecosystems work um particularly healthy ecosystems they will recover and bounce back but um, the whole tipping point issue is that you hit them and then they will not come back. Um, so the resilience is gone. And once the resilience is gone, we won't see those kinds of recoveries. But um, I do want to stress that um, 
yeah, we're not doing enough uh, with the you know total area of coral reef that's protected, meaningfully protected or uh, restored to whatever state we want to restore it, but that you know trying to um, the scalability really does need a lot more science like the paper I showed by Daniel Holstein and others to drive that. And how can we tap into that kind of research? David said, you know, we really need a lot more research on how to do this. And how do we tap into that kind of stuff and really design effective recovery of reefs? Um, even if we're not recovering with the same corals, at least we, we keep a, um, you know, some sort of a functioning state going. And I, I think also what we, we, what we fail to do, and it is because it's so depressing, is we don't create a vision, right? We don't give people a vision of, of what it could look, look like if we take all the right steps. And I, I think we, we, we're so bound up, you know, psychologically by this depressing state. Um, you know, there's some questions in here in the chat from young scientists asking what they could do. I think for them, if we do the right things by 1950, 1960, there are uh, good opportunities, particularly if we continue to do good research for really enhancing the recovery of reefs, at least in some regions, and they will see things come back like David showed on those graphs. Um, so I'm not, I'm personally not gonna give up hope. I think it is pretty dire, but we really need some sort of guiding light on, you know, that keeps people dry, driven to do this work at the, the last International Coral Reef Symposium. There's an amazing shift in people's attitudes about coral reefs. So year after year has been that reefs are, are on their way out and that's true, but this time the research was really focusing on trying to make a difference. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there and we need to keep our eye on a positive vision, even if it's a bit, um, you know, 5% chance if we're gonna hit that target, we've gotta be very, very smart about how we do that and communicate that well. Thanks, Joni. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that picks up on some of the questions and comments coming up in, in the Q&A. And maybe David, you can pick up on that. I think a lot of um, early career coral reef scientists um, are wondering, you know, how, how does one stay optimistic in light of all the facts that have just been presented, um, these big, tipping points that can be catastrophic for the world's coral reefs, but also for other ecosystems. And, you know, what kind of recommendations do you give to these early career reef scientists? Um, you know, what areas of work should be focused on in order to have an impact? Joni mentioned a few of these, you know, the uh, focus on generating visions, positive visions, focusing on bright spots. David and Joni, I'll invite you afterwards as well. Any other kind of focal areas and recommendations for this next generation of reef scientists going out there. Yeah, so Albert, I think I think for the next uh, webinar, I'm gonna shave my beard and hair so nobody can see these white hairs so you don't ask that question so pointedly as, as you just have. <laughs> I've, I've, I've crossed the threshold, that's for sure. Um, but yes, I mean, the question was, was posed, you know, how do you stay positive or, or stay optimistic? I'm, I'm a realist in this. And I mean, I, I, I live right by a creek. I'm looking outside my window and, and every day I can see, you know, small scale fishermen going out to the reef and back and they don't have much. And so I'm not so much focused on how do we keep the reef functioning in this, in this ecosystem, but how do we keep the ecosystem functioning, whatever it may become in the future, right? How do we make sure it's clean and productive in and in with species and an ecosystem that matches the conditions that are emerging with climate change and, and other pressures and so on. So I think we just have to be very painfully realistic about, about it. And I think for early career scientists, um, I mean, I, I find I'm, I'm an ecologist and I, I, you know, done most of my work diving and counting corals and looking at them and stuff like that. And I haven't really taken up any of the new techniques uh, that are really coming in. So I'm probably not a very good one to advise early career scientists, but it's really to look forward and I think become a real specialist in something because I think we really need deep knowledge, but then the ability to translate that knowledge into much broader trans transdisciplinary uh, stakeholder oriented sort of co-design type situations where you can really be a part of contributing to a solution. And, th and that's pe perhaps the most important thing is, is I think we have to realize that as scientists, we don't have the answers 
we have we have a lot of good knowledge, but it needs a, a community of people with very different mindsets to come to real solutions in this world, and especially in the emerging world. And I think prepare yourself to be part of that as part of the solution uh, with deep knowledge and good skills and understanding of the needs of different stakeholders and groups around the room uh, to, to help come to a good, you know, a, a good final place. Joni, do you want to add anything else on that note? Um, I, I think I've sort of expressed my my uh, how, how to stay optimistic approach. I, I have noticed that, um, you know, for years I worked on ocean acidification and temperature change and the modeling projections and people, you know, in the communication world, communication aspects, uh, people get really tired of hearing the bad stories and they won't take action because of it. As soon as I started working in reef restoration and and having the stories. So I just don't tell stories very well, but having the stories about that and the small successes, you invite a lot of participation, sometimes too much participation. Because people want to see um, things get better and they will participate if they know how. But we have not done a great job of doing that so far. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in it, but I think it's one way. If we want transformative change, you have to get into the home the minds of people and, and, and to what drives them in their hearts. Um, and we don't have to convince every person just enough, just enough to make those kind of changes, including the fishermen that Dave is talking about and, and other people, and even people at the very ground level. We work with fishermen too, and they need to go fishing, but you get them engaged in the conservation work or the restoration work and they, they just see the world differently and treat the world differently. And it's it's one person at a time at that level. But I think if we can we can use those kinds of psychological, uh, it's not even manipulation, but just truthisms to get people to work differently. I think that's that's uh, the hard work on the ground that needs to be done. Thank you, Joni. Um, and thank you, David, very much. So we have a few minutes remaining, um, but I want to take the time to give a virtual round of applause to, and thank both our speakers um, <laughs> for, for their excellent presentations and for you know doing such a fantastic job for answering um, the broad range of different questions. I mean, we've gone from the kind of local involvement of communities all the way to global treaties of, of dealing with, with coral reef restoration and avoiding tipping points. Um, we certainly could be speaking about this for many hours um, but we do have to end on time to uh, at least one of our speakers has to go into another meeting. So we have to be respectful of that. Um, a huge thanks for everyone that's still online, um, paying attention, participating today in the chat, hopefully in the Myra board. I haven't had time to go into the Myra board, but hopefully you've been adding a few suggestions for future research for collaborations in the Myra board. It's going to remain active for the remainder of the weeks. It's not too late. The link is somewhere in the chat, I hope. Um, so please go in there, keep the discussion going, um, commenting, interacting there. Um, there are a few events um, for core reefs and cloud feedback and atmospheric interactions coming ahead. Um, I can just take this opportunity to announce that the next event will be on cloud feedbacks on November the 23rd. And there's going to be a seminar on health implications of climate tipping points in early December. So please do check the link in the chat box. It should also be there for registration details. And if you would be, if you'd be interested to get involved in TIPMIP, the big initiative surrounding these discussions, please fill out the expression of interest form. And that's also available in the chat box and online. Having said that, I thank you all again and have a nice continued morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye. Thank you. You've been a great moderator. Thank you. Thank you. And to all.